as big as it gets. It's full screen. Okay, fine. So go ahead, get started, Nigel. Thank you. So evolution is a remarkable stochastic process, uh, which you can see uh, being displayed on the screen here, in which uh, the uh, outcome space is not known before uh, you start. It creates its own outcome space. And so what, what that means is that when we talk about evolution, uh, sort of mathematically or physically, it's not the same thing as looking at something very uh, well-defined, like say the frequency of alleles in a population. We're looking at something that is able to create uh, complexity in an open-ended way. And I want to uh, argue in this talk uh, that we don't really fundamentally understand that. And furthermore, not only do we not fully understand it, but it actually matters that we don't understand it. And so, uh, so I'm going to talk about some specific models of evolution that I've worked on. And I will, at the end, I will talk about uh, the, the broader issue of, um, you know, what, of what, what it means when we are not able to fully understand the way that evolutionary dynamics occurs. So just very quickly, uh, what you're looking at here is what I believe is a first uh, model of evolution that was capable of generating open-ended growth of complexity. And actually, in the paper, we were able to show using some uh, techniques from critical phenomena and normalization group that this really is an open-ended growth of complexity. Briefly speaking, what you're looking at here is uh, the growth of a, of a sort of tree-like organism, digital organisms competing for photons uh, with a specific genotype-phenotype map and a measure of complexity that is completely biologically uh, not realistic, but nevertheless is well-defined and easy to measure. And one of the things that we have uh, that we were able to uh, see from, from this sort of modeling is that evolution is a non-equilibrium critical point and that the processes that give rise to open-ended growth of complexity are things like gene duplication, horizontal gene transfer, which I'll talk about in the talk, which uh, enable a novelty to, novelty to be created. And by creating novelty, the system is essentially creating its own phase space as it, as it goes. And because it's doing that, uh, the dynamics is rather unusual and different from the sort of dynamics that we're used to uh, in physics. So what I want to talk about, first of all, is uh, just give you a recap of our large scale picture of evolution. Um, and this is this is work that uh, that I did with Carl Woese uh, going back uh, about 10 years or so ago. Um, and then we'll talk about uh, phylogenetic trees and uh, we'll talk about how we measure evolution in the laboratory. Excuse me, I always tend to um, cough during talks because uh, I get nervous. So, so what happens is that um, we're going to see that uh, the, the genomic footprint of evolution um, uh, leads to um, non-trivial scaling laws in topologic and metrical structure. And we're, I'm going to show you how we can uh, understand those things uh, uh, quantitatively, at least in a simple uh, minimal model. And then at the end of the talk, I'll be a little bit more philosophical and I'm going to strive to be as provocative as possible. Um, to talk about the unpredictability of evolution, whether evolution can be controlled, and I'll be making an analogy with, uh, with a topic in condensed matter physics, uh, superconductivity. So to understand this talk, you don't need to understand anything about or have any prior knowledge to biology or even superconductivity. In fact, having no knowledge might even be an, an advantage. All right, so uh, here is uh, Carl Woese, my uh, mentor in biology, uh, in characteristic pose, sitting on the front page of the New York Times, November the 3rd, 1977. And why was he there? Well, the headline says scientists discover a form of life that predates higher organisms. Uh, this was actually fake news. Um, it's not quite true. Uh, but what he had discovered uh, was actually a, uh, a third uh, domain of life. And I'll show you that uh, in, 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 in a minute. Now, I wanted to spend a minute or two talking about how he made that discovery. So here are a sequence of letters, A, C, T, G, A, C, T, you know, in some random sequence like this. And, and this, is, uh, this is what you might see if you were to look um, at your DNA and, and decode, uh, decode your genome. And of course, this, this, uh, this uh, string of letters uh, is not the genetic code. Okay, I want to say precisely what the genetic code is. Sometimes the newspapers 
say that this is the genetic code, and even scientists do, but this is not the genetic code. The genetic code is something that uh, uh, describes the process of translation. So the A, C, Gs, and Ts, uh, those are, 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 are bases that uh, form the backbone of, uh, of DNA, and they're uh, sh shown over here, and this, here is a famous picture of Watson and Crick, um, who discovered uh, what are called uh, base pairs, Watson and Crick pairing, between uh, A and T and G and C, as shown over here. Now, what happens in, uh, in uh, translation, a process which uh, Carl Woods became one of the world's experts in, um, is as follows. You start off with uh, DNA, uh, and then DNA is uh, built from four nucleotide bases. DNA is transcribed by a machine called RNA polymerase, and that builds up, um, a, that, that releases little segments uh, of, of, of biopolymers known as uh, messenger RNA, which also built from four nucleotide bases, which are almost the same as, as the ones in, in DNA. And then these uh, little transcripts here, as they're called, they're the actual uh, gene uh, coding uh, uh, transcripts. The rest of the DNA includes lots of material that has nothing to do with, with genes and some, and some of its purpose is not even uh, understood even today. These machines called ribosomes then go along the mRNA and spit out the nascent proteins and the proteins are built from 20 uh, amino acids. So you've got four nucleotide bases and 20 amino acids. Uh, the machine, this big machine, uh, moves uh, along the mRNA and it reads the uh, bases in groups of three. So shown over here, UUU, which is phenylalanine, AGC, and so on and so forth. And it reads these things, somehow manages to get the, the right um, um, amino acids, strings them together onto the, onto the emerging protein, and that's how your body uh, makes, uh, makes proteins. So when I talk about the genetic code, what I mean is the map used by the ribosome to translate the message from messenger RNA triplets of four bases into the 20 amino acids of life. And so obviously it's a very degenerate code, and this is, uh, this is what it looks like. So um, let me just move the meeting controls. Uh, so here, you, the way you read this is, goodness gracious, people keep joining. I think that's what's happening. Uh, so you, you read this like U, U, and then U, and that gives you phenylalanine, U, U, and A and G, gives you leucine, and so on and so forth. So that is the, uh, that is the canonical genetic code, and it's virtually the same for every uh, organism uh, on the planet that we know of. Um, so what Woese did was he figured out a way to map out the evolutionary history of all life on Earth, and the way he did it, it's not quite the way we do it today, but uh, what he did was he used uh, sequences of, of a gene called the 16S ribosomal RNA gene, which is a gene that is present in the, in the genetic material that codes for that machine, uh, the ribosome. And because every cell has to have ribosomes, uh, this is something that would be conserved across evolutionary time, or at least very highly conserved. And from the very small differences that you see in these molecular sequences, one can map out <laughs> a, a sort of edit path between these sequences, and here are different uh, bacteria, um, um, in fact, not just bacteria, also archaea, uh, corn, yeast, and human. You can see this particular gene, uh, which is of course much longer than what I'm showing you here, has small differences. And these differences reflect the divergent evolution history. And biologists uh, and bioinformaticians uh, know now how to uh, put these things together to work out the minimum edit path between these things so that one can reconstruct uh, the history of life on Earth. And so this is what you get uh, when you do it. And you can see that the tree of life um, has uh, three branches to it, the bacteria, the eukarya, and you may have learned about bacteria in high school, eukaryotes are cells with a nucleus, bacteria are cells without a nucleus, supposedly, and then archaea, these were the things that Carl Woese discovered, these are also sort of weird blobby things that you can see under a microscope, they were mistaken for bacteria for decades, but in fact, we can see from this that their evolutionary history is as different from the bacteria's as the authors. And here are you, um, and then virtually everything else on this, uh, on this graph is, uh, is microbial. Now, what we're going to be interested in uh, for the next couple of minutes is what happens at the root of this tree. So this is called a phylogenetic tree, or sometimes called an evolutionary tree. And at the root of that tree is what one usually calls the last universal common ancestor, or sometimes uh, the last unit common from an ancestor um, community, uh, because uh, it's probably not a single uh, organism. And the idea is that was the organism from which uh, all life on Earth uh, was uh, descended. 
Now, there are three problems in early evolution that have uh, been fairly, uh, um, the questions have been well understood for a long time, and the resolution has only been relatively recent. Um, so the first thing is that there is only a single canonical genetic code known in biology, apart from minor well-understood variants, and we'd like to know why that is, is the case. Why not, uh, if, if life, life could have evolved in many different environments, if it's generic, and so you might expect that there would be multiple genetic codes, but that's not the case at all. The second thing is that we know that the last universal common ancestor can be dated to about 3.8 billion years ago. Now, the, the Earth is about 4.6 billion years old. So what that means is that uh, in less than a billion years, uh, life evolved from nothing to organisms that had something like the architecture and complexity and structure of the modern cell. And in fact, for most of the time, the Earth was virtually uninhabitable. Uh, so the question is, how did the basic architecture of the modern cell, excuse me, evolve so rapidly initially, and then afterwards relatively slowly? And, uh, and the, the first two questions you may already have heard about, the third one, you, most of you probably haven't, and that is the genetic code is close to the theoretical optimum in minimizing errors in gene expression. And we'd like to understand uh, why that's the case. So how do we know that that's true? Well, here again is the uh, canonical genetic code uh, that I showed you uh, before. Uh, what, what one does is one tries, to, one, one tries to ask the following question. Let's suppose that there was a mistake in reading uh, uh, the mRNA translation um, or, um, and you've got the wrong amino acid. What you'd like to be able to do, if you could do, if you will, intelligent design, what you'd like to be able to do is construct a genetic code. So if you get the wrong uh, amino acid, um, the one you get is most likely to be one close to the one that you should have got, so that the protein that you make is still able to fold and function biochemically at least to some approximation. So that would be how you would like to be able to, de uh, to, to design a code. And we can see whether or not the actual genetic code has that property in the following way. First of all, uh, you have to have a, a way of quantifying the biochemical properties of all the amino acids. And actually Carl Rose proposed such a way uh, in, the, in the 1960s, balancing hydrophobicity and hydrophilicity. And I'm not going to go through uh, how he did that. So there is a number, a single number, that you can attach to each uh, amino acid. The next thing that you do is you can uh, then uh, use Monte Carlo simulation to create uh, alternative genetic codes, and then you can uh, construct a scoring system to see uh, how good each code is at minimizing error. In other words, as you swap uh, amino acids around, how does that new code um, cause you to have um, uh, um, errors that if you, make a, if you make an error in translation, you're most likely to get an amino acid nearby that has similar uh, biochemical properties. And there's a way to do that. You basically sum the squares or the differences of the um, this single number that uh, Woes uh, uh, measured. And, uh, and one can show that there's multiple ways that one can create a score from that, and that doesn't need to concern us for now. Now you can ask what would be the outcome of the following experiment. You take a whole bunch of genetic codes, let's say a million or 10 to the 8 or 10 to the 9 of them, and then you score them, and you look at the probability distribution of the score. So let's suppose that you've got this outcome. So you've got a, 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 some, some sort of bell-shaped curve, and, uh, and, and these would be the distribution of scores that you would expect from codes generated random. If the genetic code, the actual one that we observe, has a score somewhere in the middle as shown over here, then what you would say is that the code we have is just something that is random, and it must be what Francis Crick in 1968 called a frozen accident, namely, the last universal common ancestor happened to have some genetic code. We've inherited the same genetic code as, as that organism, because after all, if you made any changes to the genetic code, then you would be getting uh, amino acids that would be completely wrong. Your proteins wouldn't fold properly and the organism would be suboptimal or even die. So that was why, why, why Francis Crick uh, called this uh, the genetic code of frozen accident. But on the other hand, if you've got something like this, this is what you get at random, and then here is the actual score out in the tails, and that would tell you that the actual uh, code is, is not a frozen accident, it's something different from what you would get at random, and there was some process that generated that. So here are data from, uh, from the, this exercise. Uh, these are data from an early paper by Freeland and Hurst, and I think the first paper to do this was by uh, Hagen Hurst. 
Now, this paper shows you uh, the, the score and probability distribution, and uh, smaller is better. And uh, the actual genetic code is way down here uh, in the tail. Uh, the title of this paper was the genetic code is one in a million. But in fact, it's more like one in 10 to the eight or one in even one in 10 to the nine. And we've been able to do more refined uh, estimates of this. So the genetic code um, is something special and it ha has evolved. And how do you get around uh, Francis Crick's uh, um, frozen accident hypothesis? Well, I'm not going to go into that. Um, I I've talked about that uh, at Rutgers uh, before, although not during the lifetime of the internet, perhaps. Uh, actually, yes, probably I have actually. But uh, in, in any case, um, this is something that we that we developed um, uh, and worked out uh, about 15 years or so ago. And the important thing uh, that uh, we found was that you have to uh, include a process, not just a point mutation, but a process which I mentioned at the beginning called horizontal gene transfer. A horizontal gene transfer is where uh, genes can be transmitted, not just to your offspring, but to organisms to which you are not uh, related. Uh, by a variety of different processes. And here I'm showing you um, processes that happen in, uh, in bacteria, and, and they happen today, they're happening right now in your gut. This is where viruses can transmit uh, um, uh, genes from one organism to another. Uh, organisms, can, uh, bacteria can uh, conjugate and transfer organisms, uh, that, and they can also pick up DNA in, in the environment. And of course, if all the organisms, the microbes are doing this, uh, what happens when they all do it? Well, um, what can happen is uh, a, 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 the evolution of antibiotic resistance because microorganisms tend to spread uh, antibiotic uh, resistance genes and other non-core essential genes uh, in this way. Okay, so um, to cut the long story short, what we discovered was that in order for the genetic code to be able to evolve, uh, uh, to be unique, to be optimal uh, and to be and to do that rapidly, you had to have horizontal gene transfer at the at the dawn of life. And I'm not going to go through uh, how we did these uh, these calculations and how these how I did the we did these models. That's not the topic I want to focus on today. But the end result of that is that the phase diagram of life looks something like this. At early stages, there was a a, a uh, organisms that were very um, porous to each other. They had a lot of endosymbiosis. They could transfer uh, organisms between themselves. They could transfer organelles between themselves. They could transfer genes between themselves. Sometimes organisms even engulfed other organisms and used that to improve themselves. That's how um, chloroplasts and mitochondria uh, evolved. Uh, so, th so there was a collective phase of life, which was very rapid due to network effects. And then there was a transition to a, an era of vertical evolution, which is what I want to talk about now. Uh, vertical, meaning that we're not now having uh, gene transfer between uh, different uh, organisms, but gene transfer only to uh, offspring uh, of, of, the, of, the, of the original organism. And so we're going to look at this phase of life here, which is a slow evolutionary process, uh, a tree-like evolution. Nigel, before you go on, can I ask one question? Go ahead. So in the two billion years of Earth's existence or whatever. Um, uh, 4.6. Pardon me? 4.6. 4.6. That's a lot of multiples of 50,000 uh, year half-life of uh, radioactive material. So there was a lot more then. And I know that people have postulated that the... Uh, um, excess radioactivity in the earth was an assist to uh, rapid evolution. But um, are you saying that these network effects are much more relevant um, yeah. so that one could even ignore radioactivity as a, a, a role in that? Yes. And in the work that I showed you at the beginning, uh, we, you can see that point mutations are very ineffective in creating genetic novelty. So we have a lot of evidence um, which, I, which I can refer you to an article at the end, uh, where we can see that uh, genetic novelty is really primarily created by gene duplication and horizontal gene transfer. Gene duplication is where a gene is duplicated by some sort of accidental process, and then what happens is one of the genes, one of the copies then goes and does what, what it was supposed to do, and the other one is free to evolve in an unrestricted way, and so um, uh, uh, novelty is generated in that way. And 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 I, I didn't I didn't dwell on this because I want to get on to something else. But in the in the simulations I was showing you at the beginning, um, uh, what, what, what was what is happening there is a, is a, is a sort of um, 
a, a dynamic that was that was um, motivated by looking at the inverse cascade in, in turbulence, uh, where you could get a scale invariant regime due to the scale invariance of the evolution operator. And so, what what we're looking at are genetic um, uh, um, evolutionary operators uh, that, that are complexity invariant, and that's how one can generate open-ended growth of complexity. Okay, so let's talk about phylogenetic trees. So here is the phylogenetic tree, uh, uh, a slightly different way of presenting it uh, um, uh, that, that, that Rose had uh, discovered. Uh, sometimes these things are written in, 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 this, in this circular way. And, and what's happening here is you're seeing uh, the leaf nodes. Those are the organisms that we can directly observe. And then there's, there's in these internal nodes, which are hypothetical taxonomic units that one uh, infers by the, um, the comparative genomics uh, process that I briefly mentioned at the beginning. So uh, th these are phylogenetic trees who represent the, excuse me, the trace of the evolutionary process. So um, now I want to, uh, to study them in, in more detail. And I want to say that in some sense, in a real sense, uh, phylogenetic trees are the Feynman diagrams of evolution. And so we're going to look at the, uh, the large scale st structure of these trees. Um, and I'm going to be looking at what we can learn by taking all the, uh, all the genomes that were that have been sequenced and then construct the, the big tree of life for everything that we've uh, been able to sequence. And this is an exercise that we did um, about 10 years or so ago, and it could be done uh, much better uh, uh, today because there's, there's more data and less biased data. Uh, the work I'm going to talk about now uh, is work that was done um, and published a couple of years ago in PNAS uh, by Chi Xu and Jiru, Jiru Lu. Uh, she now works uh, at Amazon and Jiru is a graduate student with Ben Good at, at Stanford. So phylogenetic trees obviously look very uh, complicated. Uh, here, they, here they are, and you can look at them and see, well, maybe they seem to be so similar. If I blow up that little bit of it, you can't tell what was the slide uh, beforehand, at least statistically. So let's try to quantify this in a bit more uh, of a precise way. So I'm going to show you two um, quantitative descriptions of the structure of phylogenetic trees. Uh, one is the topology and one is the metric structure. So the topological structure is, is of course, one that is uh, unchanged by the change in the edge length or the arrangement. Uh, when we draw these phylogenetic trees, at least in one way of doing it, these edge lengths actually correspond to uh, mutations in DNA. And so they actually measure from a biological clock perspective uh, the time scales in the evolutionary processes. I'm going to spend most of my time talking about the topology, but I'll say something about the metric structure as well. I want to now tell you about a way that one can construct uh, measures of tree uh, topology. And I'm going to draw on work that was uh, uh, first published by uh, Gerardo et al. We discovered a couple of years later uh, by Patricia Geraldo and myself um, and, and, um, and, and published in, 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 uh, in a thesis and in a, a later paper I wrote uh, in 2014. So here is the basic me uh, uh, mechanism, uh, or at least the, the basic quantification. So we start off with, with, a, with, a, with a node, and we're going to construct a node number. And the way you construct a node number is you say you get one for yourself, and then uh, the number of subtrees, the node numbers of the subtrees, are uh, rooted uh, from you. So let's suppose we start over here. Uh, time is going uh, in this direction, going down. So these ones have one. This one here has itself one plus these two. So that gives you three. This one is the same. This one has one plus these two, and that gives you uh, one plus three plus three, that gives you seven. So that's how you get the node number. Then there's another number, which is which we can call the cumulative node number, which is the same thing, but now we're going to sum the node numbers of all the subtrees. So if we, if we, if we construct that number from this node over here, which just has itself, so you just get one, this one over here uh, has its own node number three, plus the, these two uh, cumulative node numbers down here, so you get five, and this one over here has itself plus the sum of these two node numbers, five plus five is 10, so that gives you 17. And that's how you construct this number. Now, why are we constructing this topological uh, quantity that counts the number of subtrees and, and, and nodes? Well, the interesting question is how does the, the first number, A, scale with the second number, C? So here I want to show you um, what one can, one can, one can show um, uh, um, analytically, uh, that if one looks at a tree that is completely balanced and bifurcating like this, one can show that C as a function of A asymptotically goes like A log A. 
And this probably won't be a surprise to anybody who knows how a Fourier transform, a fast Fourier transform works. Uh, so this is, this is what you get, a tree that we'll call a completely balanced one, which bifurcates at each of the nodes. On the other side here, we have a tree that is completely unbalanced. Every time there's a bifurcation, a bifurcation meaning a speciation event in the language of, uh, of, of uh, evolutionary biology, uh, then what one gets is a node that just keeps going to the present day, and then a second node that then later bifurcates, and then this, one of those nodes goes to the present day, and the other one then goes and bifurcates and so on. And one can show that uh, if I look at C of A for this, it goes like A squared. So what happens to the, uh, to the, real, uh, to the real genomic data? Well, uh, here is a graph from uh, Gerardo et al.'s paper, and you can see that C as a function of A uh, over several decades uh, scales as a power law, and this exponent is about 1.4. I don't think it's really, you can say 1.44, uh, that's the number that they quote. I, I would say it's 1.4 plus or minus 0.1. Okay, so anyway, uh, definitely not this and definitely not this. So the question we're going to try to understand is where does this, uh, this scaling exponent come from? Now I'm going to very quickly tell you about a, a, a metric measure of phylogenetic trees. And this is going to go really fast and you won't be able to get it because it's a bit complicated, the structure, the construction. It's more complicated than, um, than what I've shown you before. What we do is we define a clade. This is a clade over here, something that descends from a branching point. So we look at all nodes that define a clade with K tips, and we let L be the edge length between that node I and its branching point. So say something like this or something like that shown over here. And then we sum all of those things. Now, what you can show is that uh, if, I if you give me K, I can construct this number in the following way as shown over here. So let K be equal to one. So now I look at uh, the nodes with, with, with one tip. So there's this number plus this number, plus this number, this one, this one, this one, that gives me 25. If I look for clades which, have got, which are, have got two tips, there's just these two, and so I get three. And I can do the same thing for all these others and so on. And so I can construct this number here. And, uh, and when we go and look at the structure of S of K, how it scales, what one can show is that if one makes a, a neutral model where you have an exponentially growing community which branches without, uh, without uh, restriction, uh, this should scale as K to the minus two. It's what a mathematician would call the Yule process. On the other hand, if you fix the community size so that the trees can't uh, grow exponentially uh, forever, you, what you get is something called a Kingman coalescent, and you can show that it scales as k to the minus one. But the real uh, phylogenetic trees are these data taken on a variety of different uh, microbial communities and are put together in this paper by my former colleague, James O'Dwyer. And what one finds is that SOK scales as an exponent, k to the minus alpha, with alpha somewhere between 1.3 and 1.7. So what I've shown you then is the two stylized facts that capture the large scale, of scale structure of evolution, one topological over here and one metric over here. So the question is, what is the origin of these non-trivial power laws and what, if anything, do they tell us about living systems? So before we talk about non-trivial power laws uh, in biology, let me tell you uh, or remind you, in most cases, about non-trivial power laws in physics. So most of you will know about what happens, uh, critical phenomena in, in magnets. So the uh, magnetization. Nigel? Yes. Are, are you including trees and, and things like that? And, and you do these branching things? Yes, everything. OK, thank you. So, so if you have a magnet with an external with an external magnetic field H and temperature T and magnetization M, uh, at a critical point we know that uh, M scales uh, with some critical exponent beta. Uh, there's a breakdown of linear response theory and M scales with the external field to some power. And these things follow from a similarity formula which uh, Widom and Kazanov uh, 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 discovered and, and explained using using scaling. And um, I'm not going to go through that, uh, but what one, uh, what one finds is that if you take the, the data, uh, scale it in the way the theory predicts, uh, take the temperature in, in the way that uh, theory predicts, all of these, both of these quantities involve the magnetization, the external magnetic fields and the temperature, data from uh, multiple different magnetic materials all fall onto a universal curve, the same universal curve, and that universal curve is the same as the one that the theoretical, uh, the theory predicts uh, based on the 3D Heisenberg model, the minimization. 
And of course, this is great because it says that a model has given us a very precise prediction of, uh, of what happens in critical phenomena uh, in agreement with its bound. But in fact, it's a model of a model of a model of a model of a model, because the model that we made, the Heisenberg model, was really derived from quantum chemistry and then electronic structure, then quantum Heisenberg, classical Heisenberg, Landau theory. All of these were non-systematic approximations, a sequence of minimal models whose derivation could not be justified a priori, but is justified post hoc uh, by the idea of uh, relevant uh, operators in the normalization group and so on and so forth. And I'm sure most of you uh, are very familiar uh, with that story. So if we then go ahead and, and look at where the non-trivial power laws come from, so here I'm showing you uh, the correlation function uh, at, at TC, and, uh, and uh, as you know, this correlation function is a function of, of wave number, scales as k to the minus 2 plus eta, where eta is the anomalous scaling exponent. Now you might ask, well, wait, how is that possible? Because then we can show that the correlation function has units of length squared, and if it has units of length squared, then surely eta would have to be zero. And the resolution of that paradox is scale interference. The fact that the, actually the, uh, the lattice spacing has to come in here in this rather singular way as shown over here in such a way as to preserve dimensional analysis. Well, this is a bit strange because we know that at the critical point, the correlation length is diverging and at, at TC itself has gone off to infinity. So what this is telling you is that you have scale interference. The system is remembering small scale details, even though the correlation length is diverging to infinity. And now we're going to explore this idea of scale interference uh, in the context of evolution. So how could these sorts of scaling laws arise in evolution? Well, uh, just to recap, uh, these lengths are the, the evolutionary process, the mutations in DNA and differences in DNA. These nodes represent speciation events. So if we look at these nodes, what's actually happening there is ecology. Ecological processes, such as the one shown here, where a beaver has created a dam that has disrupted a river that has then caused a, a lake to form that has destroyed some of the elements of an ecosystem and allowed other elements uh, to survive and, and flourish and, and evolve. Uh, so these ecological processes are the things that enable a, a, a new mutant or new variation, a new, uh, a new speciation to then uh, um, uh, survive in the, its environment, uh, spread, uh, eventually uh, go to fixation and, uh, and form a new, uh, a new species that can be observed uh, in nature. So the evolution, of course, is something that is occurring on long time scales, Ecological processes are relatively short. And so when we draw a phylogenetic tree, what we are doing is we're setting the ecological time scale divided by the evolutionary time scale to be zero. And, uh, and, and that is a, a um, that raises the question, uh, even though that ratio may be small, is it negligible and is it a relevant uh, variable in the sense uh, that we uh, expect in, uh, in, in, in critical phenomena? Namely, that uh, scales, the ratio of scales that are supposedly very small, like the lattice spacing divided by the correlation length, arbitrarily small as you go towards TC, but nevertheless, uh, it remains uh, relevant. You have what uh, in, Rus in, Ru in Russian mathematical literature is known as incomplete similarity. So in fact, we do know that evolution uh, can be rapid and the evolutionary time scale and the, ev and the environmental time scales can be the same. And, and, and here's how that works. Basically, population uh, can cause structure that then creates uh, um, new metabolic uh, niches. Uh, that those metabolic niches, biochemical niches, then uh, influence the environment. The environment then selects the organisms that then uh, alters the uh, population structure. And so there is this kind of feedback loop that can occur. And, uh, and these things are so rapid that they can sometimes be observed in the laboratory. So here I'm showing you data uh, and there's many other data I could show you, uh, of uh, observations of anomalous dynamics in uh, bacteria phage, phage are viruses that attack bacteria, in bacteria or virus uh, uh, communities. Now, usually what you would expect in a predator-prey cycle, the predator being phage and the prey being bacteria, is that you would have oscillations that are 90 degrees out of phase, as you have the usual lock of Volterra type of uh, dynamics. But you can see here in these data, and there's other data, where you, the, 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 uh, the phase relationship is equal to pi. And in this example here, uh, you have uh, the usual uh, predator-prey relationship uh, phase uh, pi, phase lag of pi by two, and then something happens, and now you don't even you don't even have 
um, the um, uh, you don't even have oscillations in in the play, and the and the the, the wavelength of the oscillations, the period of the oscillation for the predator has dramatically increased. What we know is happening in these systems is that what's happening is that subpopulations are emerging through uh, beneficial random mutations, and those mutations then rapidly go to fixation through various population dynamical processes, and that gives you these rapid uh, dynamics. So these things uh, can definitely happen, and that means that the evolutionary trajectory of an entire ecosystem can be affected by this. So what I'm going to argue now is that the feedback between ecology and evolution, this timescale separation, uh, is, is, not, is not valid. Now, I want to just um, make a quick plug here for, for ways that one can study these things, because there's really close analogies between this and, uh, and Feynman diagrams. In fact, I, I said at the beginning that phylogenetic trees are in some sense the Feynman diagrams of evolution, and I wasn't joking. So here is an example of predator-prey processes shown over here. Uh, predator A plus a prey B encounter each other with some probability P. The predator eats the prey and uh, you get uh, two predators uh, coming out as a result. The predator uses the energy to uh, create a baby. And I if, think uh, if, 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 don't take if, into account events like, uh, you know, so this, uh, is a big destruction of uh, I, when you have uh, the meteors crashing in, etc. Yes. I, I will discuss meteors crashing in in just a minute, uh, Joel. Okay. That is a great question. That's a very important question. So if one looks at these, if one looks at predator-prey processes on a space-time uh, lattice, um, uh, so that they're hopping around and, and look at these things in a spatially extended way, one can develop through the uh, DOI formalism uh, ways to describe that uh, dynamics uh, in terms of uh, stochastic processes, uh, functional integration, uh, and, and, and field theoretic methods. Now, this gives rise to processes which, which you can rightly call vertex uh, renormalization. We're well aware of these things uh, in, say, uh, quantum electrodynamics or QCD, but these things happen in, in, uh, in population and evolutionary dynamics. So here is a, a phylogenetic tree that I've shown you. Here is a, a figure from a beautiful paper by uh, Uwe Teuber, who I, I, th I think might even be here. Um, a, a wonderful paper, which is essentially a review article on these sorts of stochastic processes and, and field theoretic methods that describe uh, various uh, ecological processes, such as niche invasion, range expansion, competitive exclusion, predation, and so on. And so these things are really, uh, it's really true that drilling down into these vertices uh, of these trees, one is seeing uh, ecological processes uh, in action. Now, I'm not going to dwell on, on those things. Uh, I want to talk about uh, what Joel talked about, which is large scale events like meteors and things like this. So we're going to talk about a topic called a niche construction. So in niche construction, we have the following uh, propaganda. Um, usually in evolutionary dynamics, we think that the organisms have a time evolution, which is some function of the organisms cells, their population, and of the environment. And what's new in, uh, in, in niche construction is the environment um, itself has its own dynamics, dE by dt is some function of, of E itself in some abstract way, but in niche construction is the idea that organisms themselves change the environment, so these processes become coupled and evolution becomes a collective behavior. This is, uh, there's no better uh, example of this than the fact that all of us are breathing oxygen. Oxygen was a metabolic waste produced by cyanobacteria in the great oxygenation event 2.6 billion years or so ago, which completely uh, wiped out some of the organisms on the planet, most of them, but created a new biochemical niche uh, for others, including, including us. So we're going to try to quantify niche construction in the following way. Uh, when I talk about niche, what I really mean is, in some sense, the position of a species in its ecosystem, it, its role. A niche construction is the mutual interaction between organisms and the ecosystem. Uh, the survival and diversification of a species depends on its niche. This is the topic of ecology. And the niche of a species is correlated with its ancestors because organisms have start off with some niche and then gradually uh, build out that niche and, and expand it. And so that's the evolutionary process. So we're going to make a minimal model, a laughably minimal model uh, of uh, eco-evolutionary uh, dynamics uh, to try to capture at very large scales what we see happening in these phylogenetic trees. 
So here uh, we start off with uh, nodes, and we're going to associate three numbers with these nodes. One is the available niche, one is the speciation rate, and one is the extinction uh, probability. And, uh, and what we're going to be trying to understand is exactly what Joel asked. Namely, uh, what, what happens if there are large um, uh, events in the ecosystem, extinction events? Extinction events free up uh, niches in the environment, and by freeing up those niches, they enable diversification to happen. So we're going to, so the stylized picture that what we're trying to think about is something ex exactly like this. So an organism with a large niche value has a large number of possible ways to adapt to its environment. So let's talk about the dynamics of these three variables that describe our system. So the first one is the niche number itself, and the niche that you have is inherited uh, from, 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 the, from your ancestors, uh, but can be uh, modified. Uh, and, and, and because it's going to depend on you know, how many niches you have previously, this is a geometric a Brownian motion process like this, at least in some first approximation. The more niches you have, the more likely you are to have speciation event. That uh, goes back to Joel's question about the meteors, that goes back to the great oxygenation event. And so that is captured by saying there's a, a speciation rate, which is an increasing function of the niche number. And uh, we're going to say that it looks like this. It's not important that this is a linear function. Uh, and then when, if this number turns out to be negative, which of course we're going to try to restrict it to not be negative, uh, then it just has some fixed value. So that's just a model of the, of the speciation rate. And then largely, we want to bound the growth rate of the tree so we have extinction events so that we have a sort of coalescence process going on here. So these are basic, uh, simple uh, dynamics, and we can now uh, simulate those things and see what is going to happen. Now, the only variable that we can adjust here is the variance in the, uh, in the rate at which uh, in, uh, niches are inherited. So that number is called uh, a sigma. And what you can see happening is that as, as I start off with small sigma, C as a function of A plotted over here uh, follows a curve that looks like this. This is a, a balanced tree. This is scaling as A log A. And as I increase sigma, what happens is you tend towards this line here, uh, which has a, a, an exponent that goes as about 1.5, 1 1.51, something like this. If I do the same thing, but now measure the cumulative edge length distribution, um, as I showed you uh, before, uh, you see again that uh, you get a, a scaling law uh, here, maybe not quite as an impressive one, and, uh, and, and, that, and the scaling law exponents are close to those that we observe in real phylogenetic trees. So what I've shown you is that this very simplistic minimal model which I can't justify uh, in great detail uh, a priori, uh, nevertheless reproduces both the scaling laws uh, with exponents close to those of real trees. So are these scaling laws really anomalous uh, power law scalings? And so we have to answer that, we have to figure out where does the asymmetry arise? And so when you think, look at this rule uh, for, for uh, speciation rate, you can see that there's, a, there's some asymmetry here. There's a singularity at the boundary n is equal to zero, because this n equals zero boundary, uh, where there is no niche available, is in some sense uh, an absorbing boundary, and it's very unlikely to be able to branch once you've hit that. So the higher sigma is, the higher the standard deviation is, the higher the chance you have to reach the boundary, and the more asymmetric will be the trees. So that's what's going on here, and, uh, and I'm not going to go through this in detail, but one can work out the finite size scaling analysis for this and show that indeed you get uh, a data collapse, uh, showing you that this is indeed the origin of these, uh, these anomalous scaling laws. So what I've shown you is the origin of these non-trivial power laws is an interplay between ecological processes and evolutionary processes, uh, niche construction, and that these, the structure of these phylogenetic trees reflects the indelible uh, imprint of ecological processes on uh, evolution. And this tells us that evolution is more than just mutations and horizontal gene transfer and so on. One must also take into account the context, the ecological dynamics that leads to genetic fixation, even on timescales of billions of years. I want to, in the last uh, uh, um, uh, five or six minutes or so, um, I'd like to talk uh, about a, a broader question. <coughs> um, and that's all motivated by, by uh, this, um, this conference from last year, 
in which unfortunately I was not able to attend, um, which was uh, called Biology of Physics, is there new physics in living systems? And I want to explain to you that I think that there is and why this is an interesting topic for physicists to study. So I want to very quickly, and I'm not going to, I don't want to, I, I want this to be impressionistic. I want to, I don't want you to go into these examples in great detail. We can discuss them later if, if people want to. Uh, I want to ask, are there universal phenomena in biology? Do they reveal anything important? And what do we miss by not understanding them? Now, when we talk about a universal biology, uh, I mean the following thing. In biology, as it's usually studied, we are usually given a, 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 an inverse problem uh, as follows. Suppose I was given a computer, like my laptop, and you gave it to an alien who came down from another planet and said, what does this thing do? Well, we know that what a computer is, is a, is a device that, um, that instantiates uh, a, a Turing machine with a, a von Neumann uh, architecture. Uh, and the question is, if you were given a, a lump of, uh, of silicon and plastic and display, would you be able to figure out that that is an instantiation of, uh, of, of a, a universal Turing machine with a von Neumann architecture? Now, in biology, we have that the inverse problem. We've already created the, the biology. We have the same, the same problem, but, but we want to understand what is the abstract theory? What is the abstract? dynamics of which evolutionary dynamics is the instantiation. And that is an abstract theory in the same way that universal Turing computation uh, is an abstract uh, description of, of universal computation that would underlie all systems that exhibit the characteristics of life. Now, I'll say, I'll show you some examples of, of, of things that are universal in biology, not that we have any understanding of universal biology in the sense that I just described it, but let me just talk uh, briefly uh, about universal computation. So here are two uh, different computers. The one on the left is my laptop or your laptop. The one on the right is, uh, is a piece of Babbage's a computer that you can see in the Museum of Computation in Mountain View in California or at the Science Museum in, in, in London. And this is a machine that if it had been uh, fully built, would have been a universal Turing machine uh, be because it had conditional branching built into its operating system. So a computer is not a, slight, a shiny chunk of glass, plastic and silicon, nor is it a bunch of cogwheels, springs and levers. It is this abstract uh, concept that can be instantiated in many ways. So what I'm saying is uh, the medium is not the message. You know, what, what you see here, that's not what the computation is. Computation is what's going on, what, what this thing is instantiating in the same way that a group representation is not the same thing as a, as a group. Um, it, it is just a representation of the structure of a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a group. Now, when the earliest, when the earliest physicists, Schrodinger and Delbruck and others, uh, started to work in biology, they were hoping to find uh, new physical laws, um, perhaps ones to do with quantum mechanics. Today, most of us would think that that's a little bit whimsical, but it's certainly true that trying to understand that there are new physical laws because we don't really understand how matter self-organizes hierarchically to create replicating evolvable structures, how molecules come to life, if you will. And, and so we want to try to understand not just uh, the specific realization, of biology, but we want to understand why it is that biology even exists in the first place. Because usually when we think we understand something in physics, uh, we understand why the phenomenon occurs, its existence, and then we understand how uh, it works in a particular material or, or, or situation. So, so the, I would like to argue, um, and this is not a controversial uh, perspective I would like to add, now, what, what biology is really about and what evolution is about is a kind of self-referential uh, dynamics, namely that the, the program is the data, the data is the program. And I'm fully aware that for the pedants out there, the data is plural, but so this just sounds better. Okay, so what do I mean by that? Well, here is, uh, uh, here is uh, Niels Baricelli, who uh, in the, at the time when the von Neumann was building some of the world's first digital computers at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, uh, to, to solve um, <coughs> hydrodynamics problems. 
from uh, from uh, hydrogen bomb uh, hydrogen bomb design. Uh, what Barrichello was doing was creating the world's first uh, computer viruses, and then he studied these computer viruses uh, in, in um, competing for uh, core memory and, and CPU inside the computers, and he was able to document how these viruses competed and evolved and, and did all these processes that we've been uh, that we've been talking about uh, today. So basically, I want to think of living systems as self-programming systems. They have the ability to reprogram themselves, and so they're able to respond to perturbations by creating new functionality. And I told you at the beginning that there's ways to do that uh, uh, um, by manipulating the, their own uh, genomes in order to do that. And, uh, and this is a feature that is very different from physical systems, which obey a fixed or predetermined equation of motion. In fact, I would I I, I suspect um, uh, uh, that the future state of an evolvable system is inherently unpredictable, perhaps even girdle under sidewall. And the reason I think that is because evolving systems are able to literally create uh, new functionality and therefore new dimensions to their phase space, and perhaps even change the cardinality of the phase space. Uh, and, and so um, it's very difficult to say where the system is going to be at any future time. If it's going to be difficult to say where it's going to be at a future time, that makes it very difficult to control evolving systems. And so I want to talk about about about, about that. I'm going to, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip these examples of of um, of, of universality in, in biology. And I want to skip to the to, to this this other topic. So I want to talk about um, this question of. Um, can one control uh, evolving systems if they're able to dynamically change uh, their phase space? So let's talk about superconductivity. Now, why do I want to talk about superconductivity? Well, I am a condensed matter physicist for, for one thing, but there's something really rather extraordinary that one notices when one teaches superconductivity, as I do. So here's a timeline of some of the most important discoveries in superconductivity. One of them is the discovery of zero resistance in 1911 by Cameron and Ollens, and 1933, the Meissner-Oxenfeld effect, uh, the expulsion of magnetic field by superconductors, type one superconductors anyway. Uh, in 1955, the discovery of the vortex lattice and type two superconductivity, 1962, the discovery of Josephson effects. Now, the question I want to ask is why did it take so long to make these discoveries? All of these epiphenomena associated with superconductivity took uh, half a century to discover even uh, empirically and theoretically uh, why. And it's even more surprising because when you teach a course on this, you can show very easily that all of these things follow in a few lines of algebra from the notion of off diagonal long range order coupled to an abelian gauge field. So the reason is that uh, people approach superconductivity um, with the wrong level of description. And it took people many years, many decades, to have a, a more sophisticated view about the levels of description that we use to describe physical systems. So let's end by talking about levels of description. In superconductivity, one can have the lowest level of description, which one might say is quantum chemistry and material science. Uh, then one has at some intermediate level um, the BCS theory for interacting Cooper pairs describing weak coupling uh, superconductors. And then at the, <clears throat> at the larger scale, the most abstract and uh, scale uh, is thinking of this in a symmetry related way, uh, the breaking of uh, uh, off diagonal long range order, up to electromagnetism, Ginzburg Landau theory in, in some sense, if you will. In biology, we have uh, the lowest level of description one can say that is relevant is atoms and molecules, but there's an intermediate scale where one talks about DNA, one talks about proteins, proteins folding, uh, membranes, one looks at biomechanics, one looks at the elasticity for DNA, one looks at phase transitions and liquid-liquid intracellular complexes. So this is a sort of mesoscopic uh, description of, of biology. And then at a very large scale, the one that we've been talking about uh, here, one can talk about the dynamics uh, of evolving systems. These different levels of description answer different questions. So in superconductivity, these three different levels are not all superseded by one. They're, they're, they're all very useful. Quantum chemistry and material science tells us how specific materials instantiate the BCS pairing mechanism. 
the BCS theory for interacting Cooper pairs tells us what is the basic mechanism in weakly coupled uh, Cooper pairs, superconductors, electron phonon interactions, and so on. And, the, and uh, this level of description tells us why we should expect the phenomenon of superconductivity to exist at all. Why you can have superconductivity not just in, uh, in materials, but even in things like uh, uh, um, QCD and quark stars and, and things like this. In the atoms and in the world of biology, these different uh, levels of description answer specific questions. Atoms and molecules tells you how specific biopolymers interact, how they fold, undergo template-directed synthesis. The elasticity theory for DNA, these, uh, these sort of mesoscopic descriptions, tell you about the basic functional cellular processes. And if one really understood the dynamics of evolving systems, one would understand how it is that a phenomenon of life itself can even exist. So we have these, uh, these different levels of universality that go along with these different levels of description. In uh, superconductivity, uh, this description here applies to very specific materials. This description here applies only to weak coupling superconductors, not to the high temperature superconductors. And this level of description here applies to all superconductors. This description here for biology tells you about specific biopolymers. This description here, this mesoscopic description, tells you about the physics of the biophysics of subcellular components. And this description here is the highest level of description that tells you about the dynamics of, of, of evolving systems and how life itself uh, can exist. Now, why do we need this universal level of description? And this is where we get back to the timeline of superconductivity. Only from this top level description of superconductivity can we understand uh, the response of superconductors to uh, electromagnetic fields. In fact, even the BCS theory of superconductivity uh, was not gauge invariant and did not really explain the electromagnetic response of superconductors. It had to be uh, supplanted, supplanted and uh, augmented uh, later, and there was a lot of discussion on that from Bill Anderson and, and many others. So if we don't have this universal level of description, we can't really predict the response to electromagnetic fields. Well, biological systems, if we don't have this universal level of description, then we don't have the response to not electromagnetic fields, we can't predict the response to selective perturbations. And by selective perturbations, I mean the things we apply to biological systems to try to control them. Antibiotics in the case of bacteria, insecticides in the case of unwanted insect uh, infestations, herbicides to prevent uh, weeds, chemotherapy to prevent uh, the growth of, of cancer tumors. Every time we try to control biological systems by applying these things, it fails. What happens is that the biological systems evolve around that. And so our simple uh, engineering approach to thinking of biological systems as uh, mechanical or, or engineered systems uh, is, is complete, completely wrong. We don't have a, a good understanding of its dynamics. So by regarding superconductors as collections of atoms, we're missing the emergent laws that act at the system scale and govern the large scale response to electromagnetic fields. And we know how to solve this problem. But by regarding biology as complicated physical systems, we're missing the emergent laws that act at the system scale and govern the large scale response to control perturbations. And we don't know how to solve this problem yet. So, so, so uh, let me end with a, a quote uh, from uh, Stan uh, Ulam, ask not what physics can do for biology, ask what biology can do for physics, paraphrasing uh, John F. Kennedy. And the thing I, what I hope uh, I've been able to convey to you is that by thinking about biological systems, uh, they, they actually they raise very important uh, mathematical physics issues that I don't think we really have a good understanding of. And, and by trying to understand them, we'd actually expand uh, the scope of, of physics itself. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you. Let's unmute ourselves and give Nigel a, a good hand applause for a very, very interesting talk. Uh, and uh, Nigel, could you uh, stop sharing so we can ask questions? Okay, so uh, are there any uh, questions? Uh, yes, go ahead, Sarah. Thank you, Nigel. Very, very interesting. I was, I was wondering um, in the slide when you were talking about these three levels of the three levels of description and comparing superconductors to biology. 
Um, and I was a little bit, you know, I worked mostly on theoretical neuroscience and I was wondering if I wanted to think of understanding the brain that way in within the framework that you propose, where exactly would that go? It's not mesoscopic, but it's not this very global dynamical systems approach that you are proposing. Actually, I think it is, and I'll tell you why. Because I think there's an analogy uh, between um, evolution and learning, and uh, and and, uh, and and I think so. I think that uh, that uh, learning is a process that is very similar uh, to to the process of, of evolution, and uh, and and so um, so actually, I, I think one one there, there is a way that one can uh, one one could be thinking about this uh, in 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 the context of, 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 of neuroscience. That's actually, thank you. That's a very interesting point because one can think of learning as a process that occurs in the life of an individual while evolution, of course, occurs in this much longer time scale. Thank you. And, and it's a process that is controlled by the context. So, yeah. uh, so, that, so there's even, so there's certainly evidence that, uh, that, uh, that neurobiology and, and the control mechanisms of, of neurons uh, have evolved in response to two things. One is the fact that, uh, that a brain is connected to a body and the body moves around, and so you have distributed uh, a control. Um, and the other, um, well, okay, I'll just stop, I'll just stop there. So I can, I can see there's other questions coming up. Thank you. Yeah. Is there any other questions? Uh, Paul has a question. Yeah, hi. Um, Nigel, I, I really enjoyed this. I, I just want to ask philosophically, for the last several hundred years, at least 200 years or so since Bacon, um, we have been reductionists in virtually every field of science. <clears throat> and in physics, it's been ultra-reductionism. So we've gone through high energy particle physics down to the smallest, smallest, smallest things that we can find. And if I ask a physicist to construct a chemical bond, they're very, it's very difficult for them. Mm -hmm. So I'm asking, is there another approach now? We, we've discussed this, you and I, but the obvious issue is, is there a philosophy of emergent properties that you can think of? Which is really what you're talking about with evolution. You know, predicting evolution, you just basically told us is not possible. Um, because there are many possible pathways. So um, biologists have been relegated by physicists, and I'm, I'm not saying this um, without some experience, as virtually uh, like the economists of science. They're anecdotal, because they can't write an equation for evolution, for example. So is there, is there some way of getting to emergent properties that we don't understand in the philosophy of science? And I'll, I'll shut up. Okay, um, so, so, so yeah, so I think, I think I'd like to just say the following. Um, it's true that physics is very reductionist around about the uh, 1950s or so, uh, um, a branch of physics emerged called, which we now call condensed matter physics, which went the other way. Uh, University of Illinois, where I used to be, uh, was actually uh, the, one of the pioneers uh, of, of that, where you say, let's start off with some <clears throat> agreed level of description, let's say uh, atoms and electrons in a, in a metal, and then try to work out what are the collective emergent properties from that. And I even teach a course uh, called Emergent States of Matter um, at Illinois, and then and now it's at uh, San Diego. So yes, there is a way, there is a way to, to do that. And, uh, and there is a philosophical interpretation of that, which has also, which has not eluded uh, philosophers uh, of science. Uh, in fact, um, there's a whole uh, branch of philosophy um, um, which has emerged from uh, thinking about uh, the, uh, the renormalization group. Actually, um, uh, uh, Bob Batterman, who's a philosopher of science at, at Pittsburgh, has, has written extensively on this drawing on, on work that uh, Michael Berry uh, has done, that I've done on asymptotics and renormalization group and looking at um, not, not, you know, asymptotic and collective and emergent properties of matter. So there is a philosophical uh, approach there. But I don't think the philosophy is lacking in this case. I think we just don't lack, we don't have a good mathematical tools, at least I don't, to, to have a quantitative understanding of these dynamical systems that can self-program. So I, so, so I think, you know, the first thing is, uh, 
um, you know, the first thing is you have to admit you have a problem. That's the first stage of therapy. And the second stage is that then you figure out how to do it. So I think we kind of, many people realize that there is there is an issue um you know and, and there's other people who just sort of well i just want to get on and 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 and, and deal with uh you know how how uh how to predict how flu virus is going to evolve or or sars cov2 and so on so this <laughs> was practical stuff but uh but 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 i think we do lack mathematical tools and i hope uh, trying to bring those issues to the fore to an audience like this where there's a lot of firepower uh, assembled in the audience um that maybe it'll, maybe people can start to think about things in a, in a different way so i see joachim has his hand up um uh, so uh joachim did you want to ask a question yes yes uh, thank you Nigel. so so this is you know extremely thought-provoking and many things that i have to think about but i have sort of one uh, comment on something that you said at the very end. So you, you, you said that um, there is a relation between not understanding and not being able to control. And as examples, you mentioned, for example, antibiotic resistance evolution, right? So you say, you know, we, because we don't understand biological systems, we cannot control them. But I think on a certain level, you know, Darwinism evolution is ex conceptually extremely simple. And this is, of course, something that breeders have known even before Darwin. So if you select for something in a, in a population, you will get it, right? So the fact yeah. that that microbes evolve resistance to everything we try to do to kill them is not surprising, and we don't really need it. it you know, it's not something that we don't understand, right? I mean, of yes, course, I'm, people, saying, I'm not saying that, that we, we might not be able to 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 prevent it from happening because of this this enormous space of of of, of possibilities. But the fact that it happens is not something that we need much yes. theory. To that's right. That, that, that's right. I, that, that's right. I, and and you certainly shouldn't have got the impression that I didn't think that that we didn't understand how that can happen. The issue is the issue is the control. And let me just talk about the antibiotic resistance problem because I think it's an interesting one. Um, I, I did do some work on this about ten years ago, which which we never published, although we probably should. Um, so if you take this perspective that I've talked about, one can then say, well, how might one try to deal with this? And so the answer is instead of looking at uh, a, you know a drug target and, and trying to uh, trying to treat uh, uh, bacterial infections in 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 that sort of you know, reductionist way, as Paul, as Paul talked, uh, talked about, uh, a better way to do it is to look globally and say, look at the ecosystem of a bacterial infection, and then ask in that ecosystem, what is the least evolvable uh, part of that? And what, and what can one then uh, um, try to handle in, in that? And so, um, you know, when we looked at the, the, the ecosystem of, of, say, a typical uh, pathogen, um, you know, what will happen is a pathogen will, will invade, uh, uh, say, your body, um, and then it will use a quorum sensing uh, to uh, coordinate uh, a release of toxins, that is the thing that makes you sick. And uh, applying a broadband antibiotics bat is, is, a, is a bad idea, as, as we know. But if one looks at the uh, how the organisms uh, communicate, they communicate uh, through uh, quorum sensing. And so that might suggest to some people that what you do is you then try to uh, uh, cut off the quorum sensing channel that enables them to communicate. I think that's exactly the wrong thing to do. I think that instead what one should do is actually uh, flood the system with autoinducers that then makes the uh, pathogens believe that they are more numerous than they otherwise are. And then once that happens, uh, they will emit the toxin, but there's a metabolic cost to emitting the toxin. And uh, that metabolic cost means that they will then be uh, defeated by the beneficial bacteria that are always present uh, in, in, in the host. And so, and you can work out the evolutionary dynamics of that, and, and you can show that it is a much more robust way of treating a bacterial infection than just trying to find a, a target and, and you, know, you know, find a gyrase inhibitor or something like this. And so, so that's an example of the sort of thinking, dynamical systems thinking that one might be able to use to think about the, the, how one does control in some in some way. But even that is very uh, imperfect, and and you know, not, you know. So anyway, that's that's my answer to your question, Joachim. And I see Frankia has her hand up. So, Frankia. so before before we leave that, uh, I, I don't know if many of the physicists understand what quorum sensing is. Just a very you know, we want to quickly explain that or I can explain it or whatever you want. I mean, uh, no, I'd rather not. I'd rather not. It, it, they, they talk to each other and figure out how many of them there are. And then they, uh, but only in a certain concentration. That's correct. 
But they, 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 they measure their, they are capable of measuring their concentration and, and figuring out that they have enough of themselves that they can then coordinate the release of the toxin. Okay. Is that good enough, Paul? Can I ask you a, just a speculative question? Is universality in biological evolution will have anything to, anything to do with global consciousness and macroso macroscopic entanglement? I don't know. I don't know what global consciousness means or macroscopic entanglement. I mean, universality in any complex system, like there, that means there is some kind of, there is some kind of common theme, right? Um, so how different systems know that, have that common theme? Like you basically asked how the life starts. And then you have to think about these questions, global consciousness. Is there any macroscopic entanglement? So I don't how, think how, how one system, very different system, knows about the other, how it is evolving. It's the same like two spins, two electrons know how to turn, change their spin state. Well, so 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 okay. So what I think you're asking is what are the interactions between uh, um, components of, a, of an ecosystem that enable them to interact. And uh, some of those components I, I listed, uh, there, there are things like uh, competitive exclusion, uh, predation, um, you know, range expansion, uh, the, all of these various ecological processes are the things that, as Joachim uh, mentioned, then provide selection pressure for, for evolution. So I think in that sense, uh, you, know, can, you know, can one describe some sort of macroscopic order parameter for how these things uh, uh, occur, um, not really, not not really, not really sure I know how to do that. But if that's what you mean, then uh, then it, it certainly is true that from these 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 uh, agent based interactions, these individual level interactions, one should be able to describe uh, some sort of analog of off diagonal long range order, which is what I think you mean by macroscopic entanglement. But I don't I don't really know how to do that. I think Michael Berry has his hand up. Yes, I mean, uh, um, you're, it's very central to everything you discuss, which, by the way, was both provocative and persuasive, um, that uh, your graphs are trees. Now, I'm just wondering about possible closed loops. Now, some things that you mentioned had a slight aroma of closed loops near the nodes when you talked about uh, interactions between the environment and, uh, uh, and, and evolution, but not systematically. And I just wonder whether either in, in, in nature or something we could do to evolution could uh, introduce closed loops and whether that makes any sense. We yeah, the that, thanks for the question, Michael. Yeah, the, um, so when I was talking about at the beginning about mm. horizontal gene transfer and the genetic code and, and all that stuff, there you had a network, not a tree, and there you definitely had closed loops. And the uh, and it's important to, to point this out that when we're drawing these phylogenetic trees, we're using as our measure a a very ancient and fundamental, highly conserved part of the cell's uh, architecture. So we're looking at genes that are very crucial, part of the operating system of the cell. If you screw those up, uh, you know, things aren't, go aren't going to work. So, so at the beginning of life, the, uh, my argument is that there is exactly these, these closed loops. Now, when we talk about later on uh, in, the, in the tree dominated era, then I believe that um, the core ingredients, the, the core processes of the cell that, that give right, that, that control uh, translation, transcription, and so on and so forth, um, those are basically all set in stone. Uh, the horizontal gene transfer that occurs then is for parts of the cell that are very non-fundamental, things like antibiotic resistance genes. Penny Chisholm, who's a wonderful um, uh, evolutionary uh, marine microbiologist at, at MIT, likes to make the analogy that the core central cellular machinery is like a, you know, an iPhone or a you know, smartphone. And then the, uh, the, and the, there's core machinery that is, that is the, you know, the Apple operating system or whatever. And then there's apps that you add to that, which are, which are like these accessory genes, uh, which are not essential parts of the things. And those can be swapped around at will. It doesn't really change. It doesn't, it doesn't um, constitute a speciation event. But if you take two E. coli, uh, they, can do, they, they may be, uh, from the point of view of 
uh, of species or the in, in microbiology you'd say it's an operational taxonomic unit and from the point of view of that they would be the same species but if you look at the at their payload on their genome they can differ by as much as 50 percent based on what genes were necessary from the environment in which they were taken so um so there are these closed loops but they're not essential ones for the speciation process does, so that, does, that, does that answer your question Yes, it does. I mean, I did think all the time that the fact that it's a tree was central to, to the open-endedness of, 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 yes. of evolution. But I just wondered what it would be like if you if you did have bigger yeah. closed loops. Yeah, and, if, and those closed loops yeah. mean that you evolve much faster. So it's, yes. in some sense, yes. it's rather like, you know, inflationary cosmology, where you have an exponential growth of the uh, scale factor uh, in yes. the initial stages. And then once uh, once you settle down into a radiation or matter-dominated universe, then you have a sort of slow power law growth um, after, after that. So it's kind of like that. Thank you. Uh, let me ask you again, Nigel. I didn't quite gets a full answer. Uh, how did you take into account of extinctions or other things? So the extinctions really, really come in in the sense that if you have uh, many available niches, then there'll be a, uh, a rapid speciation as a result of that. So, this, so the speciation rate uh, depends on the, in, in the model, on the, uh, on the available niches that there are. So extinction events create the, create, create the niches. Is those happen randomly? Well, so certainly in the case of meteor impacts, uh, and, and and yes, in the case of cyanobacteria changing the Earth's atmosphere. I mean, you have evolution going on in a you know, in a in a very uh, predictable way, and then all of a sudden, a cyanobacteria emerge and poison everything on Earth, and and uh, and then allow uh, high energy species like uh, like eukaryotic cells uh, to evolve and 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 dominate. So so these things are uh, unpredictable. I mean, the same thing happened, you know, in Rich Lenska's uh, long term evolution experiment, which some of you may know. He's been running for like 20 or 30 years, um, many, many populations of E. coli in a, in a very boring environment just to see what happened. And, uh, and what happened uh, was a uh, generation 20,000 of uh, these E. coli, which were basically doing nothing very interesting evolutionarily, uh, suddenly evolved the ability to eat citrate, which, which was a, a contaminant that's been put in the environment uh, 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 for, for reasons nothing to do with, with feeding them. But they suddenly evolved that capability and, and, and you suddenly had a complete, um, you know, interesting evolutionary change, not, not as, not as dramatic as a speciation event, but still something completely uh, unpredictable and, and, and unprecedented. Uh, uh, Daniel Stelzheimer has his hand up. Yes. Um, in principle, it should be possible to explain biological systems by reducing them to elementary particles, but it's not practical at all. Now, if you go further, can you have similar methods to join, to, to apply this to social sciences? which are even more complex. Um, so so um, I, I think that the, this, this logic of what I'm talking about does apply to social sciences. Um, and, um, and actually, um, and, and also, by the way, to, to, to the question that, that Sarah Sola asked uh, about neuroscience, because brains evolve not just uh, because of their in inputs from uh, from the from the body, the, the host, but also from the con the social uh, and communication context and so on. So I do think that there is a connection, but I don't know anything about, about it. I'm sorry. By the way, other people did take our work on the horizontal gene transfer and the evolution of the, of the genetic code. Um, that, that, that we did that work at a stage where the evolutionary significance of horizontal gene transfer is only just uh, being appreciated. And, and some people did suggest that these things are important um, in, in social sciences. For example, you know, libraries are obviously uh, you know, Lamarckian in, in that sense. We have ways to preserve knowledge and transfer it uh, uh, between organisms that are not uh, genetically related. Thanks for the question. Are there any other questions or comments? If not, uh, let's unmute ourselves again and thank Nigel for a really, really wonderful talk. Um, see you next week. Thanks a lot. Thanks so much. I could close with a, with a very quick comment. Michael Berry's comment on your talk, Nigel, being both provocative and persuasive reminded me of many years ago 
listening to Leo Kadanov argue about something and he said, I would argue convincingly, if not rigorously. <laughs> and somehow <laughs> I thought that that comment applies to your talk. Maybe it was not rigorous, but it was certainly convincing. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. Well, if, 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 uh, I, some of these things have been written down in, in uh, a paper I wrote uh, about 10 years ago called Life is Physics, uh, which was uh, a, a riposte to the usual refrain of life is chemistry uh, made by uh, biochemists and also an answer to uh, Schrodinger's question about what is life. And that, and that uh, essay was, was written with Carl Rosen, published in the Annual Reviews of Condensed Matter Physics. And the editor of that issue was, uh, of that, of that um, entity is, is also in the audience here as well. Hi, Jim. Thank, Thank you again. Okay, bye-bye.